I've had a few people comment recently that I look different or that I seem different or happier. And this is also in private conversations that I've had with some people who have made these observations. Now, the happier part, I'm pretty happy. So that hasn't really changed in quite a few years. Do I look different? That might be. Actually, yeah, I do. And I'm going to try to explain why that is. It's my face. It kind of shifted again. And I've talked about this in the past. I haven't gotten into it too deeply, I don't think, um, because it's just really hard for people to understand. And whenever someone brings up facial asymmetries, uh, you know, people get very conscious about it. And a lot of people are conscious of their own facial asymmetries. And they immediately want to know, well, if I do these exercises, will my face change the way that your face changed? I don't know. I can't say. You're not me. You're not peer I trained. You don't do this for a profession. You haven't done this every day for the past seven years. So I cannot guarantee anything. So I can't even answer that question because I get that question quite often. And so, but I just want to, it's a good way to explain how peer I works in a general sense overall without getting into the what each individual muscle does, because that's where people get confused and they lose, they, they, they don't realize that pain at the SI joint can really be coming from your neck or from your vision or from your teeth or from an overactive right SCM or an, the inability to expand your chest on the right side with air or the inability to fill the posterior rib cage with air upon inhalation. SI joint pain, or any pain, doesn't really, knee pain, shoulder pain, it is a symptom if it's not from sickness, disease, acute injury, just pain, we're talking about pain, is usually a symptom of a system that can no longer move due to somewhere there is an inert force, inertial force. And an inertial force is a force, is, is restriction. Something has become restricted and that tissue is no longer moving the way it should, or it's no longer allowing freedom of movement from side to side. And you know, to really understand, if you are studying PRI, if you are a physical therapist or a trainer and you're into PRI and you're studying it, which I know some people are, a book to, if you want to understand PRI from a from a uh, universal perspective rather than a local perspective, like instead of knowing exactly what every muscle is doing on, at each point in the pelvis, you get a book like this, Cranial Sacral Biodynamics. Uh, volume one probably gives you a better overall uh, picture of what's going on. Uh, volume, two is, volume two is more practical in terms of techniques. But what this is really saying, and this is very Eastern in its origin and thought processes, is that everything is connected. And with cranial sacral, they're really talking about the connection from the cranium through the neck, all the way down through the spine, and to the pelvis, to the sacrum. And then obviously, to the because the, the sacrum interacts with the iliums, and the iliums interact with the femurs, all the way down to your feet. It's all one connected system, and that's where a lot of people get thrown off. We have this midline, midline. It also happens that the chakras, if you ever read about Buddhism or anything like that, or Indian medicine or Indian philosophy, anything based on a Hindu or Buddhist tradition, uh, they talk about chakras. Where are the chakras? Well, they start, I believe, at the Cossacks, all the way up to the top of the head. It's along the midline. The midline is the midline. <laughs> That is the central organized, uh, this, that is the central location where all our human forces, everything that goes on our body, has to move around a midline. It spirals. Humans move in rotation spirals. If you want to understand, you want to understand PRI? Get a book about Leonardo da Vinci. He was obsessed with spirals in nature. He was constantly drawing spirals. He understood PRI. To know it, because PRI is just an exp PRI is not a system. It is not a tool. It's not a tool in the toolbox. It is an explanation of how the human body exists and organizes itself in space and time. And it is just it is simply the best explanation. So 
you know, Leonardo da Vinci knew PRI without knowing PRI. Jack Cornfield, the wise heart, he knows PRI without knowing PRI. Thomas Myers, anatomy trains. You want to see interconnectedness? He knows these interconnections. He doesn't see it the same way as patterns that need to be turned off, but he sees these, these interconnected parts of the human body. It's all one thing. That's the important thing to realize. Your feet do not exist independently of your teeth. I can get you to feel your feet differently on the ground by feeling your teeth differently. I can feel you. I did this with someone yesterday. I, it, it, and yeah, it sounds crazy, but it's not. Once you understand the interconnectedness, it is not crazy. It's not surprising. I, we do it all the time. So these people know PRI better than than most people who are studying PRI at this point. They just didn't know it and they don't know it. They just don't look at it in the same way. But you have to see the, the big picture, that the human body is all one thing. Everyone always says, oh, it's always it's connected. Everything's connected, everything's connected. But then when you show them how connected the human body is by doing something like, oh, making contact with your teeth a little bit differently and now they feel their feet differently, they doubt it. They're like, oh, that can't be, that's nah, bullshit. No, it's not. It's all one. Come on. So you already know it, so believe it. All right. Anyway, we have this midline, and the three midline bones are the sacrum, the sternum, and, well, you can't see it, but the sphenoid. So the sphenoid is the bone behind your eyes. Sphenoid. So when one eye is higher or lower or back, you know, it, the sphenoid's usually involved. Now, you also have the temporal bones. The temporal, quick question, is this your cranium or your pelvis? It moves the exact same way. You wanna know what a left AIC pattern is? I'm gonna take, take my pelvis from my pelvis, I'm gonna put it up to my head, and here you go. You're now looking at a left AIC cranium. And what are you gonna see? You'll see a temporal bone on the left side, more externally rotated, and a temporal bone on the right, more internally rotated. You see it, usually people will have, if there's a visible asymmetry, you'll usually see a, a more, a fuller left side, a wider left side, and a more compressed right side. You'll see a left ear that's flared out, and a right ear that's, well, not really flared out. The temporal bones, these things where your ear goes through, that, are, that articulate with the base of your skull and the sphenoid. Again, just think of the sphenoid as the eyes. These temporal bones, they move just like each side of the pelvis. The exact same movement, the exact same movement. It's only your mind that says this is a cranium and this is a pelvis. They do the same thing. They expand and they contract. They allow air to go in and out. They pump fluids, air, whatever, lymph, they open space, they close space. Same thing here. Craniums get compressed. When people get chronic headaches, they probably have temporal bones that are compressed. Why? Well, it could come from anywhere. But the point being, we have this midline, sacrum, sternum, sphenoid, and all of our movements have to revolve around that midline. When you get inert, when something gets restricted and movement gets restricted, that midline gets thrown off. And even in this book, we call, so, well, in this cranial sacral book, the healing process really begins when all tensions are reconciled around a neutral. In PRI, we call it neutral. Neutral means you're in the midline. You're, when you're at rest, you got all your range of motion because your three S bones are neutral. They're back into the front. They're, they're pretty centered. So now you can spiral, revolve, whatever you wanna call it, around the natural midline. Some people, for a variety of reasons, their midline gets altered, where they lose the midline. The midline's still there, but the whole body has shifted so that midline can't express itself. And if you can't get a midline at rest, you can't move properly because you're always gonna be shifted. Those are what we call the patterns. Left AIC, right BC, right TMCC pattern, you can think of it as a pattern that has developed for some reason and it has made it impossible for you 
to revolve around your midline appropriately on the right side and the left side. All your revolving is probably coming over on the right side. It can be a physical thing, injuries, the influence of the bigger right diaphragm, which is always going to be there. When it comes to things in the cranium, and this is, now I'm getting back to the cranium, the original point of the video, why I look different, it can happen for a lot of reasons. Cranial sacral, they talk about trauma a lot. They talk about injury, insults, insult and injury to the cranium, concussions, concussive forces. The cranium is actually quite malleable in the beginning of life, and then it starts to solidify as you get older. So people who get dropped on their head, people who get pulled, you know, they sometimes used to for, use forceps to take a baby out of the mother's birth canal. Anything like that can, can put compressive forces into the cranium and cause asymmetries, and then, you know, and that is a, that's a trauma. Uh, and, and that can cause asymmetries in the cranium, and that can throw off everything because the midline is altered. Once that sphenoid is altered, and that might be the most important midline bone, once that sphenoid position is off, that will change how your body moves to one degree or another. So in my case, I have had, I'm cranially driven. I think if you have watched my videos and I talk about my vision, my teeth, I was a cranially driven person. Until I could get this resolved, my body was stuck and I was in chronic pain. So that went on for many, many years. Unfortunately, if you look at my pictures on my website, uh, you'll see that my asymmetry showed up at a very young age, probably before I was even, that probably six or seven, that's where I start to see it in pictures. So my midline was off from a very young age and it's not surprising that my, mid, my body started to break down at a very young age. A couple years ago, I was reading the first volume of this book. And they were talking about if you're working in someone's mouth, you have to be very careful. Now, I don't really work in, because I was in massage therapy school, and actually that's where I found the book, and I just started reading it. I don't work in people's mouths. But as I was reading it, I felt pain in my tooth in my right upper molar. And because I have meditated before, and I highly encourage developing at least a meditation practice for a little bit, just to do it, and I'm not gonna get into that now, because I listen to my body, I closed my eyes, I put the book down, the pain increased, and I got a flashback. I got a flashback to being in the orthodontist chair, and the, the, big, the guy's big hairy arm, Dr. Steinberg, he had his wrench and he was you know, twisting on, tightening the, uh, the braces. And so that, I relived that experience, and I was suffocating, and it was very uncomfortable, but I knew through my, because I had studied meditation and I had studied the Buddhist psychology, I knew I had to let it process. I didn't try to, I didn't try to avoid the memory and I didn't try to get out of it, I just went with it. And you know, a minute and a half later, everything calmed down. Uh, what was fascinating was, after everything processed, I was able to breathe through my right nostril for the first time in a long time and I was feeling my weight differently on my feet. Something shifted in my cranium, some inert force some area of tissue restriction let go. For psychological reasons, I guess so. But there was some sort of connection between that psychological, that traumatic event. When someone, because you have so many nerves in your mouth, it's painful. Dentistry, people messing around with your gums and your teeth is pain. And I guess maybe I developed, maybe that was traumatic for me at that age. I was, you know, sixth grade, fifth grade, I don't know, seventh grade. And something just locked up. So something got released. I can't explain it. Just you'll have to go with it. You know, you know it's not something I can prove, but try, you'll just have to take my word for it. So, it happened again uh, about a year and a half ago. Now this time it involved pronation of my foot, and I've talked about how my left foot is oddly formed. It has an extra curve to it, which makes it hard for my left foot to pronate. That's why I had to get orthotics. Now, when I and I knew it, and that's why I was making my own orthotics. And I also knew that my sphenoid was still off and my eyes could be more aligned. And I was obsessed with it. <laughs> and so I kept working on it, I kept making my own orthotics and it worked. One day I was at the park, I was doing an exercise, I felt my left adductor, left inner thigh, kick in pretty hard as my foot was pronated because I had made my own homemade orthotics and I felt something right over here, right over here. 
And I got home. Actually, no, I stopped by my mom's house the next, uh, actually, just after that. And my mom looked at me, she said, why are your eyes so blue? And I didn't even notice what they were. Then my brother saw me, he said, why are your eyes so blue? And these two people, I love them, but they don't notice anything. But they both noticed that my eyes looked blue. And so I looked in the mirror, and sure enough, my eyes had kind of changed color. And yes, my eyes had evened out more. So fast forward. Oh, then I'll have to say, there was no memory that was associated with, no release of any memory at that point in time. But the next day, I had another flashback to something that happened in high school. And same thing happened. It processed. Uh, and my body was very relieved after that. So every shift of my cranium involved a release of a memory, except my most recent one, and that's what happened two weeks ago, or maybe three weeks ago now. Anyway, I had been, because I realized I finally had a functioning visual system, I figured, you know what, I'm going to start over. I'm going to treat myself as a patho PEC. That's why I was doing those videos, because it was on my mind. And I was working on my frontal plane. And I was feeling my adductor differently. And I was just feeling better, uh, better, I was just feeling the exercises more strongly, better. And I felt a shift, again, in my cranium. And you know, I saw that there was a little bit of a shift again. But I also felt that there was expansion over on the left side. And my left molar, the left side of my mouth, kind of felt like it had expanded a little bit. And it's very, again, could you see it visually? Probably not. But I know I'm, I'm no longer getting food stuck in between my second and first molar on the left side, where it used to get perennially stuck nonstop. So something shifted up there. And again, two or three Fridays ago, I started to feel pain in that upper left tooth area. And so I was actually driving. I got home. I just closed my eyes. I was sitting in the car. And I had another one of those moments. And no accompanying, there was no accompanying uh, memory this time. But I went through the whole process of not being able to breathe. There was major compression on my abdomen from basically from my mouth, through my throat, down through my esophagus, all the way down to my belly, basically. I was feeling convulsions. Uh, I was feeling like I couldn't breathe. I was feeling tremendous compression in my throat. And yeah, this probably sounds crazy, but whatever. Uh, this is probably this type of stuff. If someone saw, and I was, you know, my body was physically moving. That's when you know you are not in control. <laughs> There's a lot beyond, going on behind the scenes in your unconscious mind that you have no awareness of. At any rate, I went through it. it this one lasted longer than usual. And, you know, my body was moving. And, you know, this is probably something, if you had seen this 300 years ago, I probably would have gotten killed for possession, you know, by the devil or something. At any rate, everything worked out and I'm feeling good. Uh, and I felt expansion again. The whole entire weekend, I felt expansion. I was working on my frontal plane at my pelvis, strengthening that pelvis, and I felt expansion quite often through, especially through the, the, the center of my face. Uh, and I really feel like my nose is starting to curve back to the left a little bit. Uh, and my eyes are really set in a more natural position. Ears aren't going to change at this point, unfortunately. But uh, you know everything is good. So, that's really what I'm trying to get across is asymmetries in the cranium can be because of trauma, dental, memories, whatever, I, 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 a lot of things, visual. But strengthening my pelvis has also been a, in, especially with internal rotation of the left leg and the adductor, has really loosened up my cranium. And again, like what is the connection because of this midline? connective tissue all the way up from the sacrum, through the spine, to the sphenoid. You want to understand it, get one a, bo a book like this, get a book like this, get a book like this, get a book like the Leonardo da Vinci. That is what teaches you what PRI is all about. And that is how my face could move <laughs> because I was working on the internal rotation of my left leg and my, and my pelvis because it's all one thing. Nothing acts independently of anything else in the human body.